This is static analysis of Python modules using GCC. And Dave Malcolm works at Red Hat. He works on Python Core. Give it up for Dave. Thanks. Cool. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, so I, this is an, an extreme talk, so and experienced as well. So uh, I, I may have to go very, very quickly. Um, I'm going to assume that you know Python, obviously, um, and you have some familiarity with C or C++. Um, hopefully, you've um, looked at some point at a C extension module for Python. Maybe you auto-generated it, auto it using Cython, maybe using Swig, um, or maybe you hand-wrote it, or maybe you've had to step through and debug one. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the bugs that typically occur in C extension modules for Python. Um, which kind of motivates things. Then um, look at some work that I've done to make the insides of GCC, the GNU compiler, be hackable using Python. Um, and then how I've used that work to add new compilation warnings to, Py to, to GCC to detect when you get, for example, reference counting bugs in C extension modules. And, and then I've been using that work to um, to that, do a lot of um, large-scale analysis to try and basically fix all the reference counting bugs in all Python extension modules, because yay, uh, for big ambition. Um, and so the code is all free software or open source, um, the GPL v3 license or later, and it's at fedorahosted.org slash GCC Python plugin, if anyone wants to follow along. Um, and so let's talk about the C extension API for Python. Um, it's, I, I, I really like it. It's a great API for wrapping um, C and C++ libraries. You can use it to use Python to glue together um, code that you already have. Um, historically, it's also been used for speed, uh, where people have taken their inner loops of Python code and uh, re-implemented it in C. Um, but uh, thankfully, that's happening less now that PyPy is in the ascendancy. So if you want speed, use PyPy. Um, now, it's a nice API, but unfortunately, it's, diff it's very easy to get certain things wrong. And when you do, you can introduce crashes of the, of the interpreter, where it will seg fault on you, or introduce memory leaks. Um, so let's, I had a go at writing the world's worst C extension module for Python. Now, if anyone here ha hasn't used the C extension module for Python before, please do not use this as a model of what to do. I've deliberately made as many mistakes as I could while still creating code that compiles without warnings in a regular C compiler and looks like convincing enough to fool and someone who doesn't know what they're doing, that the code is correct. But it's actually full of bugs. Um, and so my, 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 I guess the quiz is, how many bugs can you see in the code that follows? Um, so let's uh, create a new, Py a new Python method in C. We'll call it buggy list of random integers. Um, although they'll actually be random longs, because this is Python 3. Uh, but you, uh, you'll see that in the next slide. Um, we'll make, uh, we, we declare it. It takes self and some args. It returns a, another pi object star. We declare some variables, uh, some temporaries, um, and a long count and i value. And at line 8, we call into pyarg parse tuple, which um, takes the argument tuple that we were passed in, and it gets a, uses a format string and some variable length arguments, which is a C idiom, um, and parses out the, um, it, it the i code there means we're expecting a single argument that we can comp well, in a single integer argument um, that we'll store away in, in the address we're passed in, uh, which is the address of count, uh, the local ver uh, long variable at line six. So we, we, if we get in a single C, the GNU compiler, be hackable using Python. Um, and then how I've used that work to add new compilation warnings to, Py to, to GCC to detect when you get, for example, reference counting bugs in C extension modules. And, and then I've been using that work to, um, to that, do a lot of um, large scale analysis to try and basically fix all the reference counting bugs in all Python extension modules, because yay, uh, for big ambition. Um, and so the code is all free software or open source, um, the GPL v3 license or later. And it's at fedorahosted.org slash GCC Python plugin, if anyone wants to follow along. Um, and so let's talk about the C extension API for Python. Um, it's, I, I, I really like it. It's a great API for wrapping um, C and C++ libraries. You can use it to use Python to glue together um, code that you already have. Um, historically, it's also been used for speed, uh, where people have taken their inner loops of Python code 
and uh, re-implemented it in C. Um, but uh, thankfully, that's happening less now that PyPy is in the ascendancy. So if you want speed, use PyPy. Um, now, it's a nice API, but unfortunately, it's, diff it's very easy to get certain things wrong. And when you do, you can introduce crashes of the, of the interpreter, where it will seg fault on you, or introduce memory leaks. Um, so let's, I had a go at writing the world's worst C extension module for Python. Now, uh, if anyone here ha hasn't used the C extension module for Python before, please do not use this as a model of what to do. I've deliberately made as many mistakes as I could while still creating code that compiles without warnings in a regular C compiler and looks like convincing enough to fool uh, someone who doesn't know what they're doing, that the code is correct. But it's actually full of bugs. Um, and so my, 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 I guess the quiz is how many bugs can you see in the code that follows? Um, so let's uh, create a new, Py a new Python method in C. We'll call it buggy list of random integers. Um, although they'll actually be random longs because this is Python 3, uh, but you, uh, you'll see that in the next slide. Um, we'll make, uh, we, we declare it, it takes self and some args, it returns a, another pi object star. We declare some variables, uh, some temporaries, um, and a long count and i value. And at line 8, we call into pi arg parse tuple, which um, takes the argument tuple that we were passed in, and it gets a, uses a format string and some variable length arguments, which is a C idiom, um, and parses out the, um, it, it the i code there means we're expecting a single argument that we can, well, a single integer argument um, that we'll store away in, in the address we're passed in, uh, which is the address of count, uh, the local ver uh, long variable at line six. So we, we, if we get in a single Um, so we'll create, use pylist new with zero to create a new empty list and store that in list. And then at line 15, we'll iterate up from zero up to the, uh, the argument that was passed in before. And, we'll, uh, and, and again, I, 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 I really hope that anyone who's used the CPython extension API at this point is feeling like they want to claw their eyes out in horror at the awfulness of this code. This is not an example of how to do it. So I feel kind of bad saying that this is what we're doing because I'll have to explain all the bugs in the next few slides. Uh, so we make a pi long object at line 16 inside the loop, uh, pi long from long, a pass use random, the C function to create a new a random value, we make item, and pi list append the list, an item, append that new item to the end of the list, and loop, and eventually you return the new list. So how many bugs can you see in this code? I count five. Um, I don't know if everyone can, if, well, I'll, I'll, I'll explain the bugs that I can, I can see in here. Um, so what could possibly go wrong? Um, well, the first of all, um, pi r parse tuple, it's, it's a, it takes a format string and a variable number of arguments, so the C compiler has no way of doing the type checking to compare that the, um, the format string that describes those types actually matches the types that are parsed in. Passed in. Now, we said um, i, and that means it's an c int variable. And on this laptop, a c int variable is four bytes in size. Um, and so it extracts a, an int and as a four byte int, uh, signed int, and it tries to store it in the addresser into, into count, um, which is declared line six as a long. And on this laptop, a long is eight bytes in size. So, uh, so we have this eight byte value on the stack of which we've written Pi R parse writes a four byte value into four of the bytes of that, but there's also another four bytes of worth of bits that are ones and zeros, and hopefully, and they haven't been initialized. Now, they might be zeros, in which case the code will work, but every now and again they might not be, in which case count will have this wildly wrong value that isn't at all, doesn't at all relate to the value um, you, you might hope. Um, and so you might get, your code might work fine for a while, and then you might suddenly get bizarrely wrong, massive, huge lists that kill the interpreter when the, the code is run because it's just huge in memory. 
There's also, it's not doing any error checking at all. Um, all of these, there are, there are three API entry points here on this slide, and all of these entry points can fail um, returning, um, well, some of them return null, some of them return an, an integer return code, um, if there's not enough memory. Um, so at line 13, if, if there's not enough memory to create the new empty list um, for the PyList new wants to create, it'll return, it'll set a memory error exception on the thread's state and return a null back. And if we then go into the list at line 17, well, that, if you call PyList append with a null as the first argument, that'll immediately cause a segmentation fault of, of, of CPython, um, and, which would be bad. You would immediately crash the interpreter. Um, and the other API calls can fail. PyLong from long could fail if, if there's not enough memory. Um, and so inside the loop, we try and create one. It return, could return null, so it's setting a memory error. And then we try and append it. Now, in this case, if the second argument is null, it actually doesn't crash CPython. And how many people know which API calls and which arguments exactly can accept null and which can't? I don't think anyone does. Um, and finally, PyList append itself can f fail, because it may need to grow the internal buffer of the list, and that could require a memory allocation. And so that could fail, and it will return minus one, and we're not checking for that. And at that point, well, it won't crash the interpreter, but you might have asked for a list that was length 100, and you only get a list of length five, and you're, get you're getting the wrong result. And I guess the question is, do you prefer to, to have the, the program crash on you, or do you prefer a, an incorrect result suddenly happening where you weren't checking for it? Hmm, interesting philosophical question. Um, so, um, but the really, so that's four problems, but the really, for me, the big problem, um, well, I, I'm always finding myself having to track down a, a reference count problems. Um, so, um, Python objects have, or at least C Python objects, have a, um, a reference count at the top of them, which represents how many, how many pointers are there in, in the memory of this process that point at me, so that when the last reference to me goes away, I can, when that reference count hits zero, um, I can, I, it can be deallocated. De now, so if, if, the, if, the, if that reference count value gets out of sync with the actual pointers in the program, bad things happen. You will have, if it's too high, you'll have a memory leak and the object will become immortal and will never be cleaned up. If it's too low, the object will be deallocated too early and you may well then have random pointer corruption and it'll probably crash. Um, and both of those are bad for different reasons. Um, and if I had a memory, a memory leak of just a pile, you might think, well, it's just a single pile long object, which is variable size, but it's probably less than 100 bytes in size. But unfortunately, because Python ha C Python has an optimized memory allocator where small objects are allocated out of, out of pools in these 256K arenas, um, if you have an, uh, an immortal object for the lifetime of the process, well, that whole arena has now become immortal, and that whole 256K block will never be returned to the system whilst this process is alive. So if you have a few of these, or many of them, well, yeah, you can potentially have loads of these scattered, and your process can become very, very big very quickly, and it's not getting any smaller. Um, so this is bad. And I got really sick of tracking down reference counting bugs. I've tracked far too many of them down, and I thought, this is C, it's a compiled language. Surely, can we automate this? And I set a goal, okay, for the next release, I work on the Fedora project, the Fedora distribution of Linux. Um, there are 360, 370 packages that link against libpython 2.7. Can I somehow automate detection of all these bugs and, and basically make sure that just kill this problem once and for all, automate the detection of this, make the compiler detect it, and not have to do all of this by hand. Um, so I started looking at automated code analysis, and there are a few thing, areas of things in this, in this space. Um, there's the, the LLVM uh, compiler project has a very nice tool called the CLang Analyzer, um, and it generates really nice graphical um, error reports for a particular set of coding errors in C. But unfortunately, it only handles C, as far as I know, C and Ob Objective-C. And my code base is, there's a lot of C, but there's also a lot of C++. Um, there's some Fortran, and there's all kinds of exciting other stuff. Um, and, and so that's kind of um, I, 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 not, not viable. There's Sparse, which is a static analyzer that was written for the Linux kernel. Again, that only handles C. Uh, there's Sil, which is um, written in OCaml. A colleague of mine used it to verify correct acquisition and releases of mutexes within libvirt, which is a virtualization library we created. But again, only C. 
Cochinelle, again, another OCaml tool. I was able to use this a couple of years ago to actually um, write type checking for PyArg pass tuple. Um, and, um, and it's kind of a cool, you can, you can auto-generate patches rather than just find the bugs. Um, but unfortunately, it still um, only handles C code. And there are also some libraries, Python libraries out there that can parse C. I don't know of any that can parse C++. Um, and there's also proprietary tools, but that's a non-starter for me in the Fedora project. Our whole tool chain is free software, open source. Um, so increasingly, I found myself looking at GCC, because all our code is going through GCC already. Um, there's a parser in that, and it has recently gained a plugin interface. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe I can write a GCC plugin to detect reference counting bugs. Um, but unfortunately, that would need to be written in C, and I don't really like, <laughs> there's enough buggy C code in the world already. Um, so I created a bit more buggy C code, but what I did was I thought, well, okay, rather than directly write the code I need, what I can do is embed Python into GCC as a, as a plugin, and then I can write the new static analysis I need in Python, um, and, uh, and basically massively increase the hackability of, wanting, of GCC, expose all the internal representation of code so you can get at it from Python. Um, and, and partly this was inspired by colleagues of mine who added G, um, Python scripting to GDB, the, the GNU debugger, uh, which I gave a couple of talks about at PyCon last year. Um, and I feel that that's been a really, really successful in, it, in that we managed to do all kinds of things in the debugger, like adding CPython um, support that's in the CPython source tree um, for, into the debugger. So I thought, well, let's do that for the compiler as well. Um, so I looked at the tutorial for, here's how to write a Hello World GCC plugin, and I looked at the tutorial for, here's how to embed Python into an app, and I kind of introduced them to each other, and very quickly um, had a working GCC plugin that ran the Python interpreter. So you see at line six, this is the C Python API call for run this fragment of Python code, let's print the time. Um, and so you run GCC with the new plugin, um, test.c, compile it, and lo and behold, you have Python code running inside the compiler doing stuff. Um, and generalized it so the, the, the Python code isn't hard-coded as a variable, it's actually taking in a script, and yay, we can run arbitrary Python scripts as our code compiles. And, um, and I had great fun with this. I was able to Im run, embed uh, Django inside GCC so that the code, <laughs> so that the code would, you, you know, you could compile some C++ code, then stop, and then serve HTTP over a port. Um, and uh, which is which is which is fun, and um, <laughs> thank you. Um, but actually, not very useful because um, because what you really want is the internal representation of the code being compiled, and to expose that as Python objects and classes, um, so that the script can actually look at that rather than just be, hey, uh, I want to serve something. Hey, I've got a process. I'll be in there. Um, so I looked at the insides of GCC. Now GCC is kind of kind of an interesting challenge from an embedding Python perspective, because it's a million lines of C code, it's 25 years old, and it's rather, as I said, Baroque in this, which is a euphemism. Um, it very heavily uses the C preprocessor. Uh, there are macros for everything. Um, it has several implementations of inheritance in C that are different from each other, and it has macros everywhere for expressing how GCC's garbage collector works, uh, littered everywhere. Um, uh, originally, I tried using Cython, and so I really like Cython. It's my um, kind of my favorite solution for generating C extension modules. Um, uh, but, uh, but it, unfortunately, GCC was just a bit too gnarly to, for that. So I wrote my own code generator, which is a f fairly simple bit of Python code to generate C, C code. Um, and, and then I used that to auto-generate C code for all the different aspects of GCC that I needed to wrap. Um, and um, so let's talk about what GCC's internals look like then from Python. So if, we look, if you remember the buggy, um, the buggy C code that I began with, with all the, the problems, um, it goes into the GCC and is, um, and is compiled, and uh, it get the, the, the characters of the source code get turned into a tree-like representation that then gets turned into a representation that is called Gimple, uh, which is a hit for historical reasons. Um, and this is a very simplified set of expressions um, that, uh, um, and you have, it creates a control, what's called a control flow graph, 
um, containing statements in this simplified representation with edges connecting the control flow graph, expressing the, um, the, con the, uh, the, the control within the function, which is, this is basically compiler 101. Um, and hopefully, um, it's, it, I'm grossly oversimplifying things, but that's what's going on. So let's create a new compilation pass for GCC in Python. So we import GCC, which is where all the API is. And I've done it, it's all objects and classes. So to create a new compilation class, you subclass, uh, in this case, gcc.gimple pass, because it's operating on the gimple representation. And every pass has an execute method, and this will be called once per function in the code being compiled. And that will be called, part of fun will be passed in as a gcc.function wrapping the C code function that we saw before. And then here, let's just print some stuff. We'll print the function's declaration's name, and then let's loop through the basic blocks, uh, the function's CFG's basic blocks, and we get a series of gcc.basic block back. So you see how I've created a, what I hope is a pretty Pythonic API to what really, really isn't internally. Um, and, um, and, and, and so it's all attributes and objects and stuff. And let's print the block's index, uh, and then where are we? We're at line uh, 13. Uh, if it's got gimple statements, let's iterate through them. We'll print the repra, we'll print the stringification. And then let's look at the successor edges of, of control flow leading out from the block and print where they go to. Um, and then, um, and then that, so we've created a new pass as a, a class with an execute method. We have to instantiate it, uh, giving it a name and then adding that instance of the pass into the big tree of GCC's pre-existing classes, passes. We'll do it after the control flow graph is the CFG pass, which is immediately after GCC builds control flow graphs for the C or C++ code. Um, top tip, don't call your pass pass, because then you say pass equals, and Python says and that's a reserved word. Um, and um, so you do GCC with Python, dump gimple.py, that's the name of our script, and then you just pass in the regular comp GCC compilation flags. Um, uh, for, so it's a Python uh, extension module, so we pass in that. And uh, so here's the code we're compiling. And then the script outputs, well, here's the name of the function. We've got a block and some blocks. And at line six, uh, there's the gcc.gimple call. So we have an instance of a gimple statement representing a function call. You can see at line seven, the stringification of it is, says, yeah, we're calling pygpas tuple, and we're going to store the result in a temporary. So GCC has introduced a temporary to um, and all that, and then there's a the next there's a GCC or Gimple cond representing a conditional, which you see on the like, on line nine is a, it represents the if that temporary is zero, and then we either go to one edge or the other based on that conditional, and um, so you see how there's a whole bunch of Python objects and classes representing the uh, the insides of the function, but that's lots of text, so we can run this is Python, we can just run a different script, uh, so for example show gimple.py. And it generates, um, and, and this basically walks over the internal representation and puts it into graphviz. And you can see the actual basic blocks and the edges between them. And zooming in somewhat, there's one of them. Um, within one, this, this particular visualization prints uh, the source code on the left-hand side interleaved with the GIMP representation on the right-hand side. And the edges have little annotations based on how the edges are annotated by GCC. And there are lots of optimization passes, and there are actually several different internal representations. And I've wrapped much of this in Python. So if you're more interested in the uh, low-level um, register layout, well, I've maybe actually, if you want to help right, work on this, I'm having an open space over there at 7 tonight. Um, uh, but yeah, there's a whole slew of things that uh, you can now poke at from Python uh, inside the compiler. So where are we? Yeah, we can now have the ability to create new GCC warnings. There's a gcc.warning um, method uh, where we can add new compiler warnings. And, uh, and um, so um, people have done this. Uh, actually, these are all my colleagues of mine uh, at Red Hat. We've, uh, a colleague um, has created two new compiler warnings specifically for GDB. Um, because we can now add a compiler warning, it's 150 lines of Python. Um, it massively simplifies hacking on GCC, and they have a particular patterns in their source code that they know they always screw up. Like here are the standard mistakes we make when you with this particular API. Thanks. Um, and um, so let's add a compiler warning for it. It's only a few dozen lines of Python code, or maybe even less. 
Um, and another colleague of mine um, wrote an analysis script so to when compiling LibreOffice, which is a very large body of C++ code, um, to detect a particular pattern and gather the results. So, and again, this is Python. You could slurp the results into a relational database. Or, um, so again, you can have a, um, a web front end to things, which is a whole new type of compiler front end, which is a bad pun for the compiler geeks in the room. Um, and, uh, and someone else, uh, another colleague, is, um, this is my favorite, is um, trying to port Emacs from its own ELISP variant of LISP to common LISP. And in order to do that, he's um, written, there's a whole bunch of, there's a lot of C code within Emacs. Um, and he has, he's basically written a Python script that, as the C code has been compiled, ports that C code to LISP, which is, appeals to my inner geek. Um, so, wh where are we? I've, I've spoken about the bugs at the beginning that typically occur in, occur in C Python extension modules. And then I've spoken about all the work I've done to make GCC more hackable from Python. So, what this is all building towards is I've built a static analysis tool, which is um, CPy Checker, which detects those bugs and issues new compiler warnings about them. And it's about 10,000 lines uh, of Python code. It lives in the same source tree for now as the main uh, the plugin. Um, and again, this is at fedorahosted.org slash GCC Python plugin. It's all free, so free, free software or open source. Um, so let's try it on our, uh, our buggy example code. So it's GCC with CPy Checker, which is just a simple harness script that adds the necessary compile flags to GCC. There's not much, really no magic there. Um, or no extra magic, um, and compiler extension. And look, and it's saying we have a new compiler warning. Warning, mismatching type in the call to power pass tuple. We had a format code I. Um, the argument corresponding for that format code is a long int star, 64-bit, but we were expecting an int star, 32-bit. So that's telling you, you've got, you, that's added type safety to power pass tuple. And then the next warning, it will detect the reference count leak on the item within the, um, thank you, um, within the loop. And it'll tell us, well, we were expecting the reference count to be this value um, because, and it's tracking, well, what are the pointers that are pointing to this? And what is the value of the reference count? Um, and it, when it notes at the end of the function, there's a mismatch, it warns you about it based on a particular path, the various different paths through the function. And there's many lines of textual output describing that. But what it'll also do is generate, because I got sick of reading the text reports, um, uh, is generate an HTML um, report um, describing this. So here's what it looks like. Um, it shows, you know, so here's the, um, the function call, and you can see the little annotation there saying, yeah, so we're considering the case when pyarg pass tuple succeeds. Uh, we take the false path following the arrow past the error handling um, uh, suite. Uh, we, we're at pylist pi new, and we we're considering the case when pylist new succeeds, and then we go to the loop. Now the loop, uh, first of all, we consider the case where count is in the range one up to the maximum um, in, uh, signed in value, uh, and we take the true path, which is the right, ar right hand most arrow. Um, and unfortunately, this is kind of, I'm, I'm definitely this visualization could use work, but hey, this is Python code that is generating HTML. So how many people in this room know how to auto dynamically generate HTML from Python? Um, hopefully. <laughs> Quite a few, um, and uh, so anyway, we've, so it's very hackable, and I would love patches to improve the, the visualization. Uh, so yeah, we we go line down, follow that right arrow to line 17, uh, where we call the pylon from long, and it says, well, we're considering the case where it succeeds, and in bold it says, well, we're considering the pylon object that's allocated here. Uh, we append it, and um, and you see the annotation for pylist append. It says, well, the reference count, well, it started at one above, and it's now two. Um, and it's also now referenced um, by uh, the uh, pylist objects or by t the zeroth element of its ob item. So essentially every time the reference count changes or the set of all pointers pointing at it, the object change, it'll emit an annotation telling you about that. So you can try and, um, uh, and again, the, the, the exact visualization could use some work. Help will be very much appreciated. And there's an open space at seven um, tonight. Um, and anyway, we follow the arrows back out round. We go now considering the case where the count is one. So we bail out of the loop to return list. And here's our warning. The reference count is one too high. 
Um, it doesn't yet tell you, well, you actually needed a deck ref, but I've added some heuristics for, for example, when you say return pi none, it'll tell you, did you mean pi return none, which is a macro to fix the ref count. Um, and uh, it has some smarts in the reference count model, so it can actually prove where a deck ref won't cause a deallocation. Um, and, to try and, and there's a lot of work I put in to try and eliminate false positives. Um, so the lack of error checking I spoke about, it um, detects that. So here's another um, error report generated by this tool. So again, we consider the case where pi plus tuple succeeds. We, we, fall, we go through to the pi list new, but now consider, you see the annotation, when the pi list new call fails. Um, we go into the loop, perhaps, or at least we go into the loop when count is um, greater than zero. Now, the pilot, we consider when pi long from long succeeds, and now the pi list append call happens. And it says in red, we're calling pi list append with null as the first argument. And, um, and then it has an extra annotation. It's saying, well, pi list append, it invokes pi type on, its, on that argument because it uses the pi list check macro. So it's actually saying, well, why is this going to crash? Um, and what I've done is I've actually gone through um, much of the CPython API, or at least the ones that I keep running, um, um, the, the first part of the long tail, um, and, um, and, do, and, 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 and basically created a description just saying what are the possible outcomes that can happen of each function call, a failure versus a success, and for each one, what is the impact on all reference counts um, or any reference counts that may be affected by this, or indeed, does it uh, deallocate memory, and things like that. Um, so how does this work internally? Well, it's, uh, basically it's an interpreter for that Gimple representation, but it's a form of abstract interpretation, as, at least as a um, very simple form of that, where rather than having specific values, I um, track all possible values. Um, and I generated set, and this is kind of a dumb way of doing it. Mathematically, there are much more sophisticated ways of doing this, um, but this works r well enough. I generate a set of all possible traces of execution through the function. So I have a tree of here's the initial state, and then what could happen next. And then I and record, well, and then eventually, hopefully, the function terminates, and here is everything that happened. Um, and I wave my hands about loop terminate. Well, I'll tell you about loop. Um, every time, uh, for all loops, I analyze the case where we go zero times through a loop and one time through a loop. And that covers, um, I hope, reasonably well, the resource management issues that we're looking to det add detection for. Uh, obviously, it's not mathematically rigorous, but if you want to mathematically determine if, uh, or computationally determine if the thing halts, that's, uh, yeah, um, an interesting problem. Um, and so we have a, a tree of states with transitions between them, and the transitions ha can have additional uh, descriptions, like this is the transition of pilist append failing. And within each state within the state tree, there's hey, where are we in the function, and then there's the mapping of here are all the, um, the variables we know about, and here are all the storage regions, and for each storage region, um, they, uh, they f there's a class hierarchy representing storage regions on the heap versus storage regions on the stack versus globally allocated. And then for each storage region, there's a mapping saying, well, what are the abstract values in those regions? So essentially, we're modeling L values and R values, and that gives us pointer semantics um, so that pointers work properly, uh, although that, a lot of other things don't. Again, patches would be very welcome. Um, so this implements uh, basically a static analysis engine written in Python um, that's pluggable. Um, so there are um, various types of abstract value. There's the unknown value where we don't know anything at all about the value versus there's a concrete value versus there's a value in a particular range. Um, there's a value pointed to region, which means this, we know this is a non-null pointer that points at a specific storage region. And there also have, I have poisoned values that represent deallocated memory or uninitialized memory. Um, and for each of these different subclasses of value, I have operations like addition, dereferencing, subtraction, comparison. Um, and so, for example, if you try and add a value to an uninitialized value, it, that'll raise an exception of a particular kind. And that'll bubble up, and the, the static analysis engine will then turn that into a compile time warning and generate the HTML report that you, you saw. Um, and, it, and it's pluggable. So this part of state kind of represents C and C++'s kind of basic semantics. Um, but you can, you can add additional domain-specific facets of state. So 
not only is it a, a very likely to hack in Python on, the, um, on GCC, but also you can extend in Python the static analysis engine. Um, and so that right now the only one is a, a C Python facet, which adds um, what is the status of the exception, the, the thread local exception state, has an exception been raised, um, do we own the gil or not? Um, and it adds some new abstract value types for that, specifically for handling the reference count semantics. Along with all that detailed information I mentioned before about um, how the CPI and API works. For example, does this function return a new ref versus a, a borrowed ref? Does this function steal a reference to argument number three? Or, um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and again, in looking there in the source tree. Um, so we, and unfortunately, it's a procedural description rather than a declarative one. So we have an impl, for example, pi mapping size is one entry point. Uh, it's rather word wrapped, line wrapped, but we, we have some metadata and then Let's at line nine, we, we'll, we'll have a transition representing success of this call, where we'll make uh, a transition representing an assignment to the left-hand side of an unknown value of the appropriate type, and we'll annotate it with a description saying this is pi mapping size succeeding. And then at line 14, let's create the failure transition, where we say let's make an assignment to the left-hand side of the call of the concrete value negative one, because that's what it returns when it fails. Uh, and again, annotate that transition with saying this is that function's metadata failing. Uh, but we can also say at line 20, um, the failure transitions destination states C Python facet, we can say, well, that's the there's a type error has been set when, when that occurs. And then at line 23, we'll say, well, there were, we return there. Here are the two transitions. We have a success transition and this failure transition. And that's how I've implemented a pluggability for describing an API. Um, fortunately, it's procedure. I wish, kind of wish now it was declarative. Maybe um, there's a way of fixing that. Um, hey, Lisp, mate. Yeah, it's not going to Lisp. Um, and so, for example, that's how the uh, description of um, failure happens uh, for pylist append. In line five, um, I'm saying, well, raise a null, raise when we, if we get a null pointer argument for argument uh, zero uh, for the pointer. But we can say why. And that can then get turned into a description to the user of, well, um, we're going to use pylist check, which is a macro that has py type, so we're going to um, dereference the ob type field. So if it's null, that dereference null of null's ob type will segfault. Uh, but we're at line 11, we can say for the other argument, if it's a null pointer, we can create a, a, a state and transition to it, representing returning negative one um, and setting an exception, in fact, with. Um, so, that, so basically I've built a gen, general purpose static analysis engine in Python running inside GCC. Um, um, and then I said, okay, let's run it on, let's say there are about 360, 370 packages in the Fedora 17 is our next release. Um, and I try to automate as much as possible uh, running it. Now it's not fully automated yet, automated yet, unfortunately, because um, the tool still has bugs in it. It's kind of alpha quality. And so, but I've automated lots of the process. And uh, so I've fired a lot of bugs, and some of them have been fixed. Uh, I'll show you some of those in a bit. Um, and until um, there was a bug where it didn't properly support C++, um, which I fixed on the flight here. Um, so I hope to rerun the uh, analysis and all the C++ code um, when I get a moment. Um, it, Swig and Cython code and other kinds of auto-generated code give the checker a real workout. Um, and I've got it to be fairly silent on Cython code. Swig, it's still pretty noisy, and I, I don't really trust Swig enough that I want to do, deal into that further and actually try and find if there are real bugs there. And yeah, and a lot of them, I'm still dealing with tracebacks in my code and um, a whole bunch of issues, because there's, you know, there's some of these projects have, are built with make files and some are dist utils, one's the Linux kernel, um, and so on and so forth. So there's a whole interesting long tail, not, right, it's not so much on the long tail as the long body, unfortunately, at this point with those percentages. But um, yeah, and um, so that's kind of where I'm at now. So then there's my, my tracker bug. So here's an example, um, Bluefish, which is, yeah, I wrote a script to also to take all of the error, those HTML error reports and create a summary and kind of triaged into most severe through least severe categories. Um, so for example, this is, this is an HTML editor that's part of the, the GNOME desktop, or at least I think 
I'm not sure actually, I may be out of date there. Um, and so there were a couple of reference ca count leaks it found in stand under standard uh, operation. It also found within initiali module initialization, there's a, um, uh, you're not ink refing something. And to some extent, everyone gets module initialization wrong, or at least no one really seems to care, because it only gets called once. And if you're not ink refing the singleton representing the integer zero, who really cares? I'm not quite sure, maybe PyPy care. Um, okay, maybe I'll, f yeah. Um, and then, and then, 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 then there's the category of there's a seg fault in error handling, or, which normally actually means there isn't any error handling. Um, and, and that's where, and, and that one there was a, um, I think it's a, you, it assumed a, a call would succeed and then dereferenced the result. So here's, an exa here's the, one of those, the reference count leaks from that, uh, from Bluefish. Um, at line 161 that's highlighted, it calls pi object call method to invoke a method, stores the result in p caret placeholder. Uh, so it's considering the case where that succeeded and pi, that gives you a new reference that this code owns. Uh, and then it goes onto line 167 the, the, because it's non-null. Uh, and then does something with it, and I got a horrible feeling actually looking at that, that um, it's uh, returning the insides of it. So that's actually a bug still. Um, but yeah, it detects that, um, that, that there's no deck ref going on there, that um, that code is gonna leak um, that string, the string that's returned by that method call every time that this C code is called. Um, also, you notice it says found one similar trace to this, my, with bad pluralization. And, um, the, what it, there's a, actually a deduplication engine which takes all the tree of traces and the things through it and tries to um, reduce the amount of spam that the, uh, that's generated. Um, so here's another example um, from CMU Sphinx, which is a voice recognition piece of software uh, that has Python bindings. And within, um, and so within this, uh, this particular method, uh, get hypothesis, which presumably is taking a sound sample and saying, well, what do we think the person might be saying? At least that's my guess of what it is. So there's a big body of code that I've, uh, I've um, snipped, uh, but essentially you have code that has two references that are owned, uh, hipster obj and hip seg obj, and, um, and that, right at the very end it calls pi build value OO on it. Now, I've actually, in, and, and within, the nice thing about having a, the scriptable static analysis engine is I've taught it what are the reference count implications of all of the different format codes of pi build value. So, um, and O adds a new reference, so it constructs a two-tuple of those two things, but adds, adding new references for the two-tuple, but it doesn't take ownership of the existing references. So both of those leak every time through. And again, that's now been fixed by uh, CMU Sphinx, the upstream project, based on my bug report. Um, here's an example from RPM, um, where yeah, maybe I shouldn't show all uh, RPM bugs, uh, from RPM's Python bindings. Um, at line, um, so there's a load of logic here for a um, RPM FD object representing a wrapped file descriptor. Uh, don't ask. Um, and it's in some error handling that begins at line 31. At line 32, we decref FDO. And then at line 33, we, we set an exception. But unfortunately, at line 35, we actually dereference FDO again um, after we decrefed it above. Um, and, and, the, and the checker actually found this, saying reading from deallocated memory uh, based on that sequence of operations. Um, so, yeah, as I said, there's some limitations. So it only complains about crashes, and it only complains about what it knows how to complain about. It can't read your mind. So, for example, for the, so it gets mo many of the bugs that I mentioned before at the, the beginning of the talk, but, um, at the, um, but for the case where the list is just too short, well, it has no way of knowing that you meant to write code that worked that way. Just, um, so it can't complain about that. Also, as I said, the loop termination is a bit of, it's a, it's a heuristic, that's the, I guess my euphemism for that. Um, and also, yeah, Siphon and Swig, well, I'm working on fixing that. Um, so yeah, so what have I, I've, I've told you about, uh, we gave a tour of the bugs that typically occur in C Python extension code. And then I described the, uh, the GCC plugin I've written that embeds Python inside GCC and thus lets you very easily hack on the insides of the compiler. And then the code that I've used to build a general purpose static analysis tool in Python running inside GCC. And finally, the pluggability and how I've then used that to build a 
static analysis of engine for reference counting. And so there's a whole bunch of different places where this is actually pluggable and hackable from Python. Um, and also then how I've used it on all this real world code. And I want to give a shout out to my employer Red Hat for paying me to work on this and give away all the code. Uh, and we're hiring, um, and we have a, um, so a stall here as well, actually. Um, so if you want to work on Python uh, for Red Hat, that's cool. Um, so yeah, um, please, if you have extension code, try the checker on it. I've got instruct and tell me about, uh, yeah, if you found bugs with it, that's great. If you ran into false positives, let's try and fix that, or at least minimize the damage. Uh, some instructions on how to do that are on screen. And uh, yeah, if you've got ideas for other compiler hacks using this, now that we can hack on the compiler using Python, that'd be great. And I'm running an open space here or over there at 7 o'clock tonight. So, uh, uh, and that's my talk. So thanks for listening. <laughs> All right, thanks.